Between 1753 and 1783, there was a war for freedom against tyranny. During the times when New York was around 13,000 to 20,000 individuals, hardly a sprawling city, where there were harsh summers and even harsher winters. This is the setting of Assassin's Creed 3. A story as old as time, good against evil, but this time not set in Italy, Israel, Palestine, or Syria. It was on a new frontier, against a completely different opposition with its own harsh realities and difficulties. It was the 13 colonies, or as we know now, America. I didn't know much about Assassin's Creed series at all when I was younger. A few friends talked about it at school and I would listen and have those vast stories in my head. I would also go home after school and watch gameplay clips of some of the older titles on my parents' desktop. It was fantastic to see these assassins running around and doing parkour. It was unique and exciting. However, it wasn't until the beginning of 2013 that I got to play an Assassin's Creed game. My father had taken us to GameStop to trade in our Wii and PlayStation 2 for the exclusive and brand new Xbox 360. Or at least new to us. After purchasing a slim Xbox 360, my dad allowed my brother and me to pick three video games, and the ones that caught our eye were Halo 4, Black Ops 2, and Assassin's Creed 3. All brand new experiences that opened me to a whole new world. However, one game stood out above the rest by showing me the beauty of American history and how dope it is to be an assassin. This is Assassin's Creed 3 Retrospective. January 2010, senior producer Francis, Bellard, and other senior members started working on Assassin's Creed 3 after releasing the critical acclaimed Assassin's Creed 2. For six months, only 12 employees were trying to decide how, where, when, and why the video game should be made. Pilar stated, basically everyone came out of AC2 to work on the product. AC3 was in development for two and a half years. And while the video game was coming to fruition, lead game designer Steve Masters wanted AC3 to feel like an actual proper transition from AC1 to AC2 to AC3. They wanted to focus on three mechanics that make Assassin's Creed. Combat, free running, and social stealth. They tried to use the old base work, but rebuilt it from the ground up, which is very noticeable in the final product. When developing, they did not just use design documents. They created pre-production test videos that explored how the game would look, play, and feel. It is a dope experience that shows unique aspects put into the game, like dual wielding or shooting two guns consecutively. I wish they had kept a few elements from the concept demo, like the lighting system. It feels way more immaculate. But to the base game, the lighting lacks in comparison. With that, you could also track enemies with blood through snow, and animals could also track your target down. They do this in-game, but more like you look at these mud tracks and you search an area that becomes smaller. It could have been more exciting and interactive. It holds the player's hands a little too much. You also collect scalps for bounties, but as one developer said, it didn't fit Connor's character in the game. So AC3 was built on an entirely new engine with all the same parts, just allocated for different reasons. The developers wanted to have massive crowds and big armies, shown in game and for the time, quite impressive, even if a little janky. So with the team redesigning the entire engine from the ground up, they wanted to make the main protagonist, Connor, have his own style through traversal and combat. In the first designs, they've added armor upon armor to bulk up Connor, but the developers realized that this made him look clunky and unrealistic. They switched it up and bulked up Connor compared to the other assassins. 
as they made him bulkier and made him stronger, which resulted in Connor's jumps and movements having way more force and effort behind him. The animations just became realistic. They used mocap actors to portray human interactions through running, climbing, and fighting to figure out how all these actions would flow. The next step was designing the game space. They kept asking what parts the player could and should traverse. They went beyond just building. Players could hop over tables and climb trees. They realized they could start making the forests and cities more of a playground. While I do love this mechanic and how you can almost traverse anything, once you start playing the game you often notice the paths and flaws. It never mixes it up. And after two hours, you desperately ask for a change that will never come. They put tons of work into it, but once you see the exact path repeated, you just stop caring. I just wanted more variety and sadly, it never truly came. Eventually. The game was set to be announced and talked about at different conventions, on videos, and in magazine articles. Ubisoft CEO Yavis Gilmont confirmed during an earnings call that the game will be released in 2012. After some internal leaks and Game Informer coverage, Assassin's Creed 3 was unveiled with a cinematic trailer on March 5th, 2012 at the E3 2012 press conference. Now, I was rewatching the E3 conference and stumbled upon this. Oh my god. <laughs> Francois, I have a fan question for you, though I would love sure, to see it. Sure, absolutely. Time. Mm -hmm. This question was asked by a member of the UK named Brett, who is the enemy, on the Assassin's Creed Facebook fan page. And he asks Will there be a lot of focus on the British forces being the enemy? All right, that's a great question, Brett. <laughs> in Assassin's Creed, the enemy's always been the Templars, and it's still true in Assassin's Creed 3. But truthfully, the real answer is in the game itself. <laughs> <laughs> I was surprised to see Dupuskis here. I know we went off the deep end and does not make YouTube content as much anymore, but I thought seeing him was funny. The other entertaining thing was the lead developer gave a very vague answer to the question when he could have just said, yes, you will fight the Brits. He gave this odd answer like he would offend the British or some other country. The US won, so we can dig at the British a little. An article that I enjoyed reading and owning is the Game Informer issue 228 by Matt Miller. In this interview, Miller talks to creative director Alex Hutchinson. Hutchinson stated they Quote, wanted Connor to be more of a freedom fighter. He's not out for personal revenge. If he sees injustice, he will help. Connor is the underdog for the people, and I like that touch. In writing, Miller stated his impressions. The team hopes to use the game to highlight how the Assassins and Templars' viewpoints both exist on a gray moral spectrum. I felt that this story showed the flaws of the Templars and Assassins, and I thought they did a great job exploring those aspects. In an article called What It Took to Build the Revolution by Mikel Perez, Mikel interviewed Lafieri. He talked about how they created Connor to stand in stark contrast with the flashier Incio Alatori, representing a return to the more tactern stoic template established by Altier. Connor was made to establish a new assassin, a new chapter, and I believed they knocked it out of the park. So Assassin's Creed 3 starts with a simple tutorial, just going through all the mechanics like walking, running, climbing, jumping, free running, air assassination, and then it just puts you into the story as Haytham. This surprised some players because you weren't playing as the main character all the marketing was focusing on, which was Connor. But before I continue, I'm playing this game on Xbox 360. You can get this game on PC or the remastered version on the Switch, PlayStation, or the newer Xbox. But I'm a cheapskate, and I still have the original one on 360. One main gripe with this game is how the first six hours are basically a long tutorial. It only takes off the training wheels once you get to play as Connor when he's an adult. It is annoying, because it goes through every little mechanic, like sword fighting, shooting rifles, and riding horses. However, once the long experience of being taught everything is over, 
you can experience America all by yourself and do whatever you fancy. Now this game has lots to offer. First, the combat had a considerable renovation. It is one of the most satisfying experiences. The animation flows fluently, becoming a bloody beautiful puzzle that transitions to every enemy with every thrust of the sword or swings from the tomahawk. I mostly kept with the tomahawk because while all the other weapons were enthralling to use, like the big hefty axe or the swashbuckling sword, it didn't allow the same number of combos and didn't have the same entertaining animations the tomahawk possessed. It is one of the most versatile weapons that is always fun, no matter the situation. They also updated the parry mechanics and what you could do with it. It would allow you to throw the enemy off their feet, or create an opening for you to throw some free punches. Another mechanic they finally added was allowing the player to assassinate any enemy with any weapon instead of only using the hidden blade. These minor improvements helped keep the game fresh and relevant with the times. So, upon combat, you also have parkour, which has always been a main staple in the Assassin's Creed series. You run across roofs and make trees your jungle gym. You still have fantastic synchronization on top of high trees or peaks of buildings. All of it just it works well because you can slide under tables, mantle over markets, and bounce off objects like a feline with a little more weight. At the same time, I love all these things in theory because when it works in game, it works perfectly. But once you try to add the free running and enemies and random objects and people, it starts becoming more of a fight of trying to control Connor. And it starts feeling like the game is constantly against you. It became a chore. So I ran everywhere on the ground rather than the building. Now the time and weather changes throughout the game, which is a nice change of pace. It also affects how you can play the game with heavy snow, making you stop around in the forest instead of gliding through effortlessly. It also has storm and rainy weather. All these weather mechanics work for and against you, and you notice it in a ton in the naval combat. When the naval combat was presented in AC3, it was the most praised gameplay loop, and I agree with this opinion. It is not as defined in Assassin's Creed Black Flag, but it is fun. The primary coil of commanding the ship is to shoot cannons, either with a full volley or swivel cannons. They can destroy smaller combat ships or even be able to blow up the ship's black powder kegs. Now while fighting to stay afloat, you will have to embrace for cannon fire from other opponents but also at times rogue waves, if fighting in storms, which can either help or become a detriment. Another mechanic I didn't use as much was ramming into ships, because I had way too much fun causing havoc with cannon fire. However, you also must pay attention to the winds and how fast your boat is going. Sometimes you may need to turn on a dime quickly so you put up half sails and drift, like you are in the hills of Japan. Overall, I never had any complaints about the ships, I never believed it to be unfair with its handling or enemy types. It's always a fun and decent challenge. Now other things that can distract you are hunting or mini games. For hunting, it is self-explanatory. You either run up to an animal and stab it, or shoot a bow and arrow into a deer or rabbit. You can also track animals by finding where they eat or through certain tracks. And after you take an animal down, you can skin it and sell it to any traders money. The mini games are old school board games. All I can think of is on top of my head is checkers. But they also have others that can vary from complex to easy, depending on who you are playing against. Now at shops, you can buy and sell just about anything. You can buy all types of weapons and tools that are always just used in combat. You have smoke grenades, rope darts, poisonous darts, and many other great options. Also, you can buy maps of collectibles and outfits in the store. The costumes are lovely, with many different colors and patterns, but with little variety. Now, if you collect enough feathers or Alamac pages, you can get special outfits at the homestead, but I only collected three. The Captain Getup that looks like a dope pirate, prisoner outfit when you go to the prison in the game, and Achilles epilogue outfit, which I enjoyed for the older style. They're good options but I was too lazy to collect the rest because you are crazy if you think I will collect 100 plus feathers. My favorite side mission, other than the story, were the peg leg missions and all the side homestead missions. 
for the homestead missions, you find people having hard times or just needing a new start, and you tell them to live near you and Achilles' land. So you help them and see the once empty land grow to become a settlement with general stores, doctors, and more. It was a nice distraction and a change of pace to the main missions. Now, my all-time favorite mission was collecting peg leg trinkets. Throughout the four maps, Boston, New York, the Frontier, and the Settlement, this guy has these trinkets scattered around. Once you collect them all, they tell you where you can find parts of a map to find this epic outfit, which is the pirate one I mentioned earlier. The four missions were drastically different, which I loved. Once was stopping some plundering Brits. That was simple and a good one. It showcases some good combat and parkour to try to grab the first piece of the map. Next, you stealth your way into a British fortress. Maybe it was not the best stealth mission, but it was still fun, especially when the ships start bombarding the fortress so you could escape. The third map piece was on an abandoned ship in the middle of the Arctic. It looked gorgeous, and once the boat started breaking apart, you tried to leave, and it flew you all over the place, trying to get out. It was dope as hell, and a terrific set piece. The last piece was kind of out of like a haunted villa where a murder happened. It was the weakest of them all. But eh, it still had a unique style. And then eventually takes you to Roanoke Island. And that's where you get it. You get the outfit. These side missions were the game's highlight for me. Next to the combat and story, it was rich in detail and entertaining. It was rich in detail and entertainment. But of course, only some things were fantastic. But now, onto the deck! Here we go again. Honestly, I don't remember all the stories of Assassin's Creed up to this point. But you basically, you are Desmond, an assassin. He gets captured by the Templars, so they can use the DNA to see other assassins' memories in Desmond's bloodline and find the Apple of Eden. He gets saved and then tries to find the Apple of Eden before all the Templars and basically the third game is the conclusion of the whole story arc. So that's kind of a quick rundown. Desmond finds the last piece of Eden but needs to figure out how to open it. So back into the Animus. You start the story with a man named Hathen Kenway, a British dude who is smug. You start the game at a theater where you must kill a dude with an object on a necklace that you need. Then you bring that to the Assassin's Group, and they tell you your journey must now go to America so we can start a new group there. You then meet Charles Lee, who seems like a swell guy, and the other bands of misfits. William Johnson, John Picketier, Pit Pitkerner, Thomas Hickey, Benjamin Church, and Nicholas Bibble. With this group, Hatham can find more allies and get closer to his goal of finding the Apple of Eden. In the process, he finds a Mohawk woman named Ganyadil and starts to like her. She is badass. And Kenway and her bone and have a kid. But like any other good day, he goes where to find the Apple of Eden, finds nothing, and then never returns. Oh, he's one of those dads. After finding nothing, he also kills Edward Braddock so that Lee can join the club of misfits. And that's when the player finds out that they're playing as the Templars once Lee gets knighted in. So basically, everyone you stabbed probably worked for the Assassins or was against the Templars somehow. It was a fun twist, and I was shocked when I played it at 13. So it kind of lives rent-free well in my brain. So what's next? Where does the story go now? Well, now you get to play the character and the marketing material, and who the main protagonist is. Who are you? My name is Rado Hangado. Right. Well, I'm not even going to try and pronounce that. Or, as Achilles calls him, Connor. Now, I still am not sure how to say his real name. It's dope, though. When Connor was a young lad, he played hide-and-seek with his fellow friends. But when the game was happening, he was grabbed up by Lee and some of his lackeys. They knock him out, and when he wakes, 
He sees his village burning and runs to help. He finds his mother trapped and is unable to rescue her. Years later, Connor has grown to be more of a capable man, and through a premonition through the Apple of Eden, he starts his search for Achilles Davenport, a once skilled assassin, now retired. Achilles trains Connor and becomes an assassin, but with age comes knowledge and the will to choose how you want to lead your life. I enjoyed the story quite well, primarily because of Connor's constant struggle between right and wrong. The one obstacle that always comes up is peace and freedom. Achilles believes this is the only achievable through killing the ones needed to die. Connor's father, Hatham, believes in this belief, which is hard for Connor. He doesn't want to kill his father, but doesn't believe in the Templar's way. I find it quite interesting, because the Templars and Assassins want power in different ways. Templars want power, always be controlled by a few, and Assassins believe the world can work without anyone controlling it. It is an excellent notion, and in theory it sounds great, but it's kind of impossible. I like this story so much because it's like the Revolutionary War. Two sides are fighting for a correct belief, but at the end of the day, no one truly wins. Money is the true power and winner. Do the Templars win at the end of the game and series? All relative. But just how Ubisoft portrayed the ideas and struggles through the Native Americans, expatriates, the British, and Connor himself, you start wondering if it's all in vain. Which is the true beauty of good storytelling. Was it worth it? They portrayed the time well. Now, I'm no historian, but from doing just quick research, you can find evidence that George Washington was going to use the Native Americans for his gain and not help them achieve freedom or how they used a real tribe called the Mohawk people to betray Connor and his people. It's a story about an honorable man in a situation where the underdogs don't win. Even when the game cuts to the parts with Desmond, he sacrifices himself for humanity's betterment and hopes the fight for the wrong and unjust will continue. Even though the story went through some cut content phases, there is a great story here. The game may always be a struggle for me to control, but it's a diamond in the rough when it works. The voice acting from many talented actors and actresses is well executed. This game is unique because like its story, it's a phoenix that is always reborn through the ashes. Like Connor's story in the game and the Assassin's Creed series as a whole, I believe Assassin's Creed 3 to be the underdog. <laughs>